Jumptron. What's that? John Tron's back, and he's in California again. So way to do it. The topic of today's episode, Nintendo Overworlds. You know the ones. Nintendo's got a knack for making little overworlds here and there that they use in their games. And I might bend the rules on this one a little bit, but we're going to detail the top ten Nintendo Overworlds. Let's not waste any time. Let's not waste any birds. Let's do this. Number 10 Diddy Kong Diddy Kong You gotta love that Diddy Kong Trouncing his way through all these levels with Fatter Kong You know what he needed You know just what he needed A car racer, why not? Every fucking person and their mother has a car racer. Mario Kart, Crash Bandicart, Sonic and Sega Plagiarism Kart. I'm just sitting here waiting for Resident Evil Kart is what I'm waiting for. The thing is, Diddy Kong Racing's not just like any other kart racer. Oh no, 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 it's got an overworld hub. Yeah, I know, right? What the f- You can traverse it by car, hovercraft, or plane, and it leads you to all the different worlds and levels. I guess this was their attempt at making kart racing a more single-player experience? Well, nice try, guys, but spoiler alert, it didn't work. Just kind of weird. But there was some sort of mystic appeal to it. What was it? Oh, yeah, it was this. How do you pick your vehicle? You just crash the shit in the Taj here and you're good to go. Hello, friend. Kids got skin of steel. Number nine. Don't know why, but that commercial is burned into my mind from childhood. And it's not even a good song, so I don't even know why. Kirby! Nightmare in Dreamland! Kirby! Nightmare in Dreamland! Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland is one of my favorite Kirby games. By and far. Was it the portable feel? Was it the cutesy graphics? Was it the music? Yes, it was all of that. Pink balloon balls aside, this game had one hell of an overworld. I know it's just a remake of Kirby's Adventure from back on the NES, but Nightmare in Dreamland had something the NES version didn't. 16 bits and awesome sound quality. Graphics totally don't matter as they do. You got to hop from one stage to the next via numbered doors, and hell, every now and then you'd come upon a minigame or two, and even a room with Kirby's copy abilities waiting on pedestals. How convenient, huh? Oh, and how could we forget such amazing level names like... Yogurt Yard. Number 8 Scenario, you're 7 and shit You're playing some Final Fantasy 6 Shit's all 2D and shit You exit the screen Holy fuck, what is this? It's like all of a sudden the world in all its glory opened up to you All 3D and shit Whether it be by airship, by chocobo, or on foot There was always a There was always a There was always a what can be missing so great after all? My favorite of these Final Fantasy overworlds straight up has to be the one from Final Fantasy IX. Listen to that music! So soothing. Anyone else think it sounds like the Skype call ringtone? <laughs> no one? Okay. Number 7 What's the best way to pick your level in a game? Isn't it obvious? Grabbing a star and, uh, flying into space. Well, well, that's cool, but there's just something so joyous and reassuring about playing a Mario game, and Mario Galaxy is no exception. In fact, it just might be the best. After a particularly fierce level, you can always come back to the Comet Observatory and, uh, chill. Or do this. <laughs> Super Mario Galaxy 2 went for a more streamlined approach, which I can appreciate just fine, but there's something so... magical about this place. I mean, there's not particularly that much to do, it's just fun, that's all. What more do you need? I guess you can stuff Lumas with star bits that are death, or oops, no! 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 Not this room! Oh, fuck my god, I'm back! Number six. What happened here? Oh dear. Oh dear, what happened here? Conker's Bad Fur Day was going to be another kid-friendly, jiggy, star, golden banana collecting game that got scrapped during development. And then I guess everyone in the Rareware office had a collective aneurysm, singularity was reached, and the raunchy Conker's Bad Fur Day was born. Yep, a kid's game turned into one of the most controversial games of recent history. What? 
What? Why? What? Why would you? Why would you do that? Thank you. Thank you for doing that. But why? The situation was so dire they actually had to slap this warning on the front so parents didn't accidentally pick it up for their kids. Oh, life. How you surprise me in great ways sometimes. And you know the best part? Look at the overworld in this game. Whatever it's called, who cares? The Conqueror's Bad Fur Day overworld. There you go, slap that on there, hallelujah. You can tell this overworld is probably from the original 12 Tales Conquer 64 title, but you know what? I don't even care what it's from, it's freaking amazing! Listen to the music! The music alone sells it. It even follows you around to the different themed parts of the world. How awesome is that? There's tons of characters to meet all over the place, and throughout the adventure, story-altering events change the world in real time, giving the player a sense of progression. That's what it's all about. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day just might be Rareware's magnum opus. Pretty much the last game they made before, you know, we don't speak of the dark times. Number five. Nintendo can be a bit flippant sometimes, huh? They've got a knack for making their share of bad decisions. But when Nintendo gets it right, man, shit! Hadouken is coming. Just move. Move from the Hadouken because that is a Nintendo Hadouken coming towards you. You n undodgeable. Undodgeable. Some beautiful person over at Nintendo headquarters looked at Woohoo Island from Wii Sports Resort and said to themselves, hey man, this shit's got potential. Yes, sorry about that. You heard it right. Nintendo took the astounding Woohoo Island and made it the hub world of the jaw-dropping 3DS launch title, Pilot Wings Resort. I don't know about you guys, but my favorite part of Wii Sports Resort was just flying that little plane around going pew 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 and exploring. It was just straight up relaxing and fun, so what better way to continue a good thing than to make flying-based missions centered around it? There isn't one. That's what I'm getting at. Number four. This one was gonna be the Super Mario World of World. Then it tied with Super Mario Brothers 3's Overworld, and there was really witty analysis. But I couldn't find footage of either of this shit, and I would have had to play the whole game myself to get it, so fuck it! Number three. Oh, what? This isn't really an overworld? Or Barney's just Glenn Beck in a soup, but you don't see me complaining. Of all the Zelda overworlds, I was trying to determine which one was the best. And it really came down to Termina, Hyrule Field, and the vast ocean from Wind Waker. Man, I love all these games with such a passion that it glows at my core. But I'm gonna have to move all my chips on Hyrule Field, god damn it! It's something that I haven't experienced with a game for a long while, a deep-rooted feeling of adventure. As soon as you left the Kokiri Forest and took your first few steps into the Great Hylian Expanse, you knew! You just knew, okay? This was gonna be something real special. What makes this qualify as an overworld for me is because, well, pretty much was. It was the place in the game you'd always return to before progressing, and you could see all the different areas looming in the distance. Look at that. Isn't that just spectacular for the N64? You could see Death Mountain, Lon Lon Ranch, the entrance to Gerudo Valley, and Lake Hylia. It was just a grand feeling of, I don't know, I don't know, something. Stop pressuring and make this shit up. And the world would even change with the passing of events. It made you really feel like you were progressing through time on an epic quest. And really, what more is there to life? Except that and that and that and that and that and that. Number two. Whoa, mama, holy dark dangle nuts. This is the one we've all been waiting for, isn't it? The overworld that single-handedly defined all of the worlds to come and outdated ones prior. Peach's Castle from Mario 64. What a beautiful thing this was. What a beautiful thing indeed, huh? That music is just enchanting. Listen to it. Peach's Castle is basically as self-explanatory as it gets. It served as a hub world for all of Mario 64's levels. You'd access each world through paintings on the walls, and not to mention there were tons of secrets for you to find. You cannot. You cannot look me directly in the eyes and tell me the first time you did this, you didn't jizz immediately. I'm talking immediately, like, just jizz your pants, like, whoa, whoa, It was that kind of thing we'd never seen in games before, and it was that kind of thing that hooked us then and for many more years to come. Who could forget the boo in the hallway, the slide that you access through the secret window, the eeriness of the basement? 
It's times like these we may never genuinely have again. I do so very much cherish these memories. In Polygonal Gaming's infancy, a game like Mario 64 may have felt weird and disjointed without a proper hub world. So I do declare, it's a good thing this old castle was there to tie it all together. I'll never forget you, old friend. Castles can't be friends. I couldn't not. I couldn't not put this at the number one slot. I tried to rationalize that Peach's Castle was better, but you know what? It just isn't. Spiral Mountain is the definition of an overworld. It's done what most overworlds have strived to achieve and failed to do. It's what baby overworlds want to grow up to be. It's simply something that can't be described with words. So here I go describing it with words. Firstly, you start off your adventure down here in Banjo's little cottage hut McDoodle and everything's all right, everything's great, yeah! But then a witch named Gruntilda kidnaps your sister. But uh, what do you expect? If you move next to an evil witch's giant fortress, you're probably asking to be raped up a butt with a trident at one point in your life. The first area serves as a training ground, but soon you'll enter the witch's esophagus. Mm -hmm. And that's when it all starts getting epic. Back in this day and age of gaming, developers are trying to find a way to make a game with incongruent levels feel like a cohesive experience. Well, with Gruntilda's Lair, they sure accomplished their goal. You weren't just playing some game. Mm. This was an adventure to get your sister back from an evil witch, yo. You toiled for hours and hours collecting jiggies from Mumbo's Mountain, Treasure Trove Cove, Mad Monster Mansion, Freeze Easy Peak, Gobi's Valley, Clank's Camp, Bone Swamp, Rusty Bucket Bay, and a... <laughs> just to keep on climbing. Just to keep on climbing with a sense of purpose and indignation. Man, I do love a good video game. If you're on YouTube, click there to see last week's episode. Or, uh, last month's episode. Sorry about that. <laughs>